Phenomenon. This is one of the early chapters in the book, This Vast Being. I wrote it in early April. He had died January 4th, 2003. My late husband, Jeffrey Joel, sometimes told me he could see spaceships hiding in clouds over the Tetons. He would point out the presence of energy vortices, as well as of fairies, elves, and other spirit beings in nature. And he told stories of strange encounters, like the time when he awakened from a dream of being in the Kalahari Desert with a shaman to discover his hiking boots, which he kept in his closet by the front door covered with clay. I was, of course, always astonished and intrigued by these experiences and would beg for more. He would wave me off, dismissing them as unimportant. Mere phenomena. Thus this chapter's title. I imagine that everyone who knew Jeff would agree that he was an unusual man. This story of the phenomena which trailed his departure like phosphorescence in a heaving sea continues that unusual legacy. The death of a loved one releases energy. As spirit rushes from its binding in material form, shock waves spread into family and community. Through phone lines and email, the waves radiate in widening circles. Within 24 hours, most of those who knew him or her suffer the sudden halt of daily busyness. Minds lunge to grasp the new reality. Hearts open fully, if briefly, to listen to what is and is not of value. And if death releases energy, then sudden, unexpected death is a cataclysmic event. Our ordinary world stop cold. Wind rushes in to announce the presence of mystery. It has been three months since Jeff died. Since then, my entire life has been lifted into the invisible arms of my beloved. This may sound like metaphoric flight, the sincere but temporary teary-eyed sentiment of a grieving widow. It is not. I sit cradled in the void that holds the slow whirling of death and life. All my life I've longed to be worthy of the attention of one of humanity's archetypes. This is the death goddess, the great crone herself, in whose honor Jeff and I publish a small but potent magazine, Crone Chronicles, a journal of conscious aging, for 12 long years. It turns out the crone was stalking me, Jeff's death ushered her in full-blown. This essay is a commentary on the slow, sure ways she lets us in on the omnivorous nature of the real. For me, the interval between that early morning shock of discovering his lifeless body on the bed and my personal absorption of this new reality has a peculiar ontological feel. Both space and time are affected. Experience space as if there has been a shearing of two tectonic plates, each upholding a separate world. Between the two plates is a narrow path which, if I hold a focus, I can use to go back and forth between this world and his. And time? It not only, quote, flies, unquote, and crawls, unquote, as the usual metaphor suggests, but time now bumps along in a descending series of thudding jolts. With each jolt, I sense an even deeper tear of the matrix which held us evaporate. I marvel and weep at each new recognition of just how profoundly multi-layered, how textured and nuanced was our bond. Correction is our bond. For the path between worlds remains. And each dissolution carves away the trappings of form to reveal the essence of spirit. As I surrender the hooks coupling my personality to his, so the soul within each of us comes forward. My unconscious works mightily to let go of attachment to Jeff's incarnated self, while simultaneously my heart opens to the presence of the love in which my being is held. There is no net loss. There is, in fact, a subtle and all-pervasive gain. I sit inside the fragrant garden of divine abundance. This too may sound like a flight of fancy, but be assured that on the mundane level, at hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, irregularly spaced but sharp intervals, 
over and over, I still find myself coming up out of whatever daily task I'm engaged in to stare in the mirror of this unfamiliar new reality. What? I internally shout, bereft, disbelieving. No, it can't be true. But it is. It always is. Over and over again, it is true. His car still sits in the driveway, but that does not mean Jeff's home to greet me. His bathrobe hangs from the hook next to mine and will not leave that hook again until I personally remove it. The rest of his clothes are gone, but his beloved mathematical, musical, scientific, literary, political, psychological, sociological, shamanistic, and metaphysical books in many different languages, 250 boxes of them, not to mention his classical, oriental, Native American music tapes and CDs, 30 boxes, his medicine bag and pipe, his skis and snowshoes and bike, all hunker in the basement, awaiting dispersal to new homes. Yes, he's indeed gone, and he left me to deal with a mountain of stuff. His stuff, that he was so excessive in all directions, was by far the biggest issue for me in our relationship. I am by nature abstemious and somewhat austere, and was overwhelmed by our slow, insidious immersion in more and more stuff, and told him so many times. I instinctively knew that I would be the one who would have to deal with the stuff in the end, and told him that too, vehement. The very thought of having to plow through his rich morass exhausted me. Had I known myself better when he was alive, I would have noticed that those fleeting premonitions of having to work with his remains rendered me desolate. But the books and the music were Jeff's friends, perhaps his closest friends, as I realize now, and during the two month long postmortem project of sorting, deciding what to keep and what to recycle, what to give to friends and family, what to sell and donate, I found myself actually enjoying this belated plunge into his emotional, mental, and spiritual range and depth. I felt like a child unwrapping Christmas presents, the contents of each box a magical mystery tour. What would I find now? What would make me stop in my tracks to read? Thus, what had been our biggest stumbling block transformed into the gift of his munificence to me. Even in death, he was my teacher. Going through the stuff also kept him tangibly here. But this job is now done, and he's still not gone. Indeed, he's more present than ever. I feel closer to him now than while he was in human form, because I always sensed him holding his essential self closely, protecting himself, hiding even from me, or maybe especially from me. While in body, many could sense that Jeff felt constrained, held down, held back, his large brooding spirit dragging around that heavily muscled, big bellied body, scarred from all those colon oper operations, those heart attacks. Like his mother, he was embarrassed about his size. Both were Leos who wore their shadows on the outside, their dense physical encumbrances embedding the splendor of ancient souls. He kept trying to make himself smaller, to conform to standard taste. I exhorted him to glory in his immensity, to discard tight clothes, to wear loose shirts and pants, to even dare to wear long robes, to dress like the king that he was. Remember, I would admonish him, your son is at the 29th degree of Leo, conjunct Regulus, of course, he dismissed this idea with a snort while carefully and obsessively measuring tiny gains and losses via the notches on his belt. Angeli, one of the more metaphysical people in our community of souls, lives on top of a mountain near Los Alamos, meditating on war and peace. She called to console me a few days after he died. I told her that his cremation would be the next day, and she said, when? Because I want to go into meditation during that time. Two months later, we spoke again. She told me she had stayed in meditation for the entire four hours of his cremation and had the distinct feeling that he caused his own body to flash into fire through spontaneous combustion that, quote, though there might have been something mechanical going on also, he was in charge, unquote. She then told me that more recently, during a candlelit dinner with her husband, 
she happened to glance at the flame and noticed a tiny being emerging and disappearing, like Aladdin from his lamp. At first she thought it must be a nature spirit as she had been recently working with them, but the little creature kept whooshing in and out until she noticed that he was bald with white corkscrew curls and wearing a long robe. Parentheses, I had dressed him in a long robe after tenderly washing his dead body. End parentheses. Suddenly she knew it was Jeff, insistently passing in and out of the flame until she recognized him. Quote, and I got the distinct impression, unquote, she told me laughing, quote, that he loved being small. Now that he's out of material form, he's free to be any size he wishes, end quote. Angeli and I have never before talked by phone, yet her reaching out to me was not unusual. For not only did my dear companion leave me, his father and sisters and his many friends from many different communities behind, but I noticed since then that the linkages among some of us were abruptly shattered and often just as abruptly reconstituted, but deeper, more heartfelt. Others, like Angeli, have connected with me for the first time after years of honoring each other from a distance. In Jeff's death bloomed paradox, for it was his sudden absence that announced the magnitude of his living presence. We are finally discovering who he was, or at least we are acknowledging how much his usually silent, observant awareness meant to us. His death brought us closer in life. We feel vulnerable and hold tenderly those who remain. For if any death releases energy, and if, moreover, sudden death is a cataclysmic event, then the leap from incarnation of a great soul like Jeffrey is a clarion call to all creation. As we, in our grieving, seek to keep him here through memory, we start to recall and tell each other stories which glimpse aspects of his multifaceted reality, only to come away astonished and disturbed by how much we did not know. We discover that each of us was graced with a tiny piece of the puzzle that was his vast being on this earth, that each of us interacted with a man who was so full and so large that he had room for all our quirks. He could meet us there, wherever we were, and be glad. Jeffrey was a giant sponge, absorbing the joys and pains of our world. He was a watcher, overlooking the action while smiling inside, as meanwhile he was being called, forever called, into other worlds to which only he was privy. I was with him for 12 short years, and in the rare early mornings when he'd awakened to tell me he'd remembered a dream from the night before, I would eagerly ask about it. Why do you want to know, he would say, amused or even annoyed. Because I need clues as to who you are, I would respond coyly, pretending a casualness I did not feel. Parentheses, I always felt like a pipsqueak next to him. Again, he would dismiss my need to know him as one more symptom of my, quote, lack of boundaries. That first night after he died was agony, a peculiar sense of being suspended between heaven and earth and unable to access either. As the weeks roll on, this space of suspension has become my treasured home, a soft, safe place hidden from prying eyes. I discover that literally hundreds of people care for me, but no one really needs, nor do they ask, to know in detail what I'm going through. This zone of privacy, this very intimate environment in which I'm allowed to process and integrate loss, is a wonderful gift. Yes, I am still suspended, and now this state of being feels good. I remain in the little home in Bloomington we shared for such a short time before he died. Every day I begin with yoga, qigong, and tai chi. I move through this ritual to center and strengthen my energy so that I can more fully appreciate the present, the extraordinary gift of the here and now. And though I remain suspended, and though my experience of space and time has altered to reflect the new context, I now notice that the boundaries between heaven and earth, between this dimension and other wilder ones, continuously disintegrate. And here is where, I suppose, I might finally begin to focus fully on the story of the, quote, phenomena attending his death, 
For as my reality shifts, I discover that above and below are not separate, but intermingled. They swirl. I've abandoned my usual press forward ahead orientation. I'm lost in mystery. And paradoxically, I feel I've finally been found. I sense my awareness simultaneously creating and exploring a space in which the essence of both Jeff and myself can play. Indeed, a space that is the essence of Jeff and is the essence of Anne, not together, but one, not hand in hand, but inside each other, my soul in his, his in mine. We are the field in which my embodied being, my quote, personality, unquote, plays. I am, my body is, the locus of our action in the world. Both feet on the ground, like a wedge, implanting other dimensions into this one. Parentheses. This new reality of interdimensional oneness was made abundantly clear in a dream in which he and I were walking through a store, pushing a shopping cart, buying food. It was the most ordinary of daily life routines. Suddenly, in the dream, I realized that I had been writing obits for him and telling people he was dead, when he was not. In the dream, I apologized to him profusely for this drastic mistake. In parentheses. The post-mortem surrender to oneness has no definition and no edges. The very act of exploring itself pushes boundaries into the far distance where they turn porous and dissolve. I am attempting to give form to the ineffable, to see into the void, to grasp and describe the nature of this brand new world into which his so-called death has shoved me. My attempts fail. The ineffable slips through my mind like our cat Felix flows from the reach of my seeking hands. The edges of the world no longer exist. The edges of what I believe and don't believe, of the ideologies I used to hold, of my strongly held ideas of right and wrong, blur. No matter how strong my personality's usual determination to keep them separate and divided, my heart opens to encompass them all. And if there were ever to be a test of my new and strange and unfamiliar compassion for all the players in any human drama, it is the so-called Second Gulf War on Iraq, blaring from TV and newspaper headlines. Though my awareness of humanity's latest tragedy moves me as usual to fury and fear, for the first time in a life filled with images of war's horror, I am not caught in polarity. What has caused this change? How has Jeff's death worked such wonders in me? I bow before this mystery and I recount for you here the marvels and miracles that have spiraled forth since that early morning when he suddenly and unexpectedly whooshed out of our shared earthly household. On the third day after he died, I dreamed that he came to me in the guise of a beautiful young man. Parentheses, I did not recognize his body but knew it was him, in parentheses. We were at a noisy party, and he took me into a back room. There he told me, or I got the sense that he transmitted to me, that I was to be in school, and that this school would last for two months. I asked him if he was working on helping the Mideast, and got a surprising answer. No, he said, that is old. At the time, his remark was puzzling, but now, more than two months later, I sense what might be a glimmer of its meaning. This sense has come in through the way I have been living, which is to read the New York Times daily and to watch the TV news nightly and then to put it all aside and bring aloha to every moment of every day, to every person I meet, to the sun and sky and stars and the exhaust from all the cars, to settle into this one moment here, now, to follow the call of beauty to let the old world go and inaugurate the new. There have been times when I've been puzzled by this response, by this decided bifurcation of worlds within me. For yes, I do wail and gnash my teeth in the face of the seeming stupidity and destructiveness of the world's power brokers. And yes, I do live in beauty. Both are true. The one does not negate, but completes the other. Thus do polarities within me both increase their separate intensities while being mutually included in an even larger dimension, a transcendent field of joyous play.
to feel Jeff and I as souls, as beings, essences inhabit together, or rather the dazzling, endlessly sparkling space being woven through this play. The night after that first dream of Jeff, I had another dream in which I was being escorted into dimensions Jeff now inhabits. A universe so beautiful and so thrilling that there is no way I can describe it. Indeed, because I cannot give words to it, I cannot remember it. I can only remember that I had the vision of splendor, not its content. Even so, these two dreams announce the onset of a series of events. Do I call them that when they are in no way of this ordinary world? that trailed his leaving like phosphorescence in the wake of his giant ship as it slipped silent into the approaching dawn. There were those who, during the first few days after his departure, saw him in their mind's eye flying. Scott. Jeff was flying, laughing, with curly hair streaming out behind him. He was wearing a purple-pink thing. Scott's wife, Todd, who receives information through automatic writing, said the word describing Jeff's passing was breathtaking, literally taking away the breath as it was so dynamic. She later emailed me a copy of what had come through her writing. Quote, enormous, energy, sparkling free, couldn't contain it any longer. Parentheses, it burst upon him in parentheses. First, it's a pirouette, then the waltz, then marching band. All music, enormous music. This image is given over to the exploding clown at the circus who turns into the monkey doing backflips onto the elephant trumpeting in full voice. Oh my! Giggling uncontrollably. Trying to control the seriousness is important, but for the life guffaw of me, I can't get there to the seriousness. This is so much fun. I always wanted to do this consciously, and here it is. Such immense pleasure, such boundless joy, such unspeakable truth, such, giggle again, unpronounceable words, no words, just unmitigated joy, fun, exhilaration, all running together, all over and through me, the me that sparkles, jumble of sparklets. Oh, the beauty, the exquisiteness. I'm finally speechless, giggle at least for a while, this moment. But wait, I love you, dear Anne. You are the light shining for me. I love your enormous sparkle too. See, I can stay serious for less than a nanosecond. It's glorious, later, later. He's humming music. That's the end. The first notice that this was to be an unusual passing came within two hours of Jeff's death when my new Bloomington friends Herb and Perry did ceremony with me. Herb and Jeff had known each other as Princeton undergraduates. I created an altar on Jeff's Tibetan prayer rug with some of his crystals and little Inuit sculptures of animals and dolphins surrounding a candle. In honor of Jeff's embrace of all the world's religions, we planned to include Psalms from the Bible and the Jewish Siddur. We began by reading from the Tibetan Book of the Dead thinking we were to help Jeff pass through the Bardo state into the light. Halfway through the reading, we looked at each other and murmured, amazed. Jeff doesn't need this. We needed it. We were the ones who were wandering in shadow, working with shock and pain and confusion, not him. Already, we were sensing his light, joyful, active presence in the room. Just then, a sudden gust activated the wind chimes outside the window. Parentheses. Ever since then, I hear these chimes as Jeff calling my name. They gently return me to the present from my wandering. A few days later, I received this note via email from a friend, Kate, and her eight-year-old daughter, Stella, who'd been our neighbors in the mountain village of Kelly, Wyoming. Quote, I burst into tears when I hung up the phone from Lynn's call with the news, and Stella came immediately to my side, embracing me legs to waist. She remembers Jeff well, and after holding one another for a while, we went outside in the morning air and called out his name to all of life here, west, south, east, and north. Then Stella came back inside and on her own gathered every bison figure and image we have in the house and also a multitude of owls, setting them in a very specific arrangement on the kitchen table. We lit candles and kept his altar for several days. We also let animals we came in contact with over those several days hear of his change. End quote. 
I replied. Thank you so much for your vigil with the animals. Did you know that we created an altar here surrounded by his sculptures of animals and that when my friend Perry and I washed Jeff's body, her husband Herb was reading a rollicking poem about animals and that Felix, one of our cats, cavorted among us for that whole ceremony? How wonderfully synchronous. A few days later, another friend phoned to tell me of her experience upon hearing the news. She and her husband Tim were honeymooning on the island of Maui. Later, Deidre sent me a, a story via email. On January 4th, 2003, Tim and I went to the Eye of the Needle, a sacred site at, on Maui known as the Burial Place of the Chiefs. We chose this place for our ceremony to release Jeff because of the beauty and power of the place with a powerful altar used by locals and because there is a huge feral community of cats there and I wanted to feed the cats in Jeff's name. Also, the idea of the burial place of the chiefs attracted me as Jeff was a chief on all psycho-spiritual levels. We approached the altar, which is directly in front of the Rock Hill Formation that is the Io of the Needle, just at dusk. The sun was behind a cloud. I picked yellow daisies for Jeff. Tim sat on the ground facing the needle and prayed. I held the daisies in front of the altar and closed my eyes. Immediately, I was bathed in a beautiful gold and yellow light. I thought this was the power of suggestion from the yellow flowers, but decided to work with the color. That golden color filled me and all my images of Jeff. I opened my eyes to look at the needle as I prayed, and the sky had opened, and the sun shined brightly on the rock formation. There was a lichen or some plant on the rocks that glowed a beautiful golden yellow light. At that point, I felt Jeff's presence very strongly. I spoke to him of the love I have for him and how I will miss him, and I wished him well and released him to the light. At that point, he spoke to me in my head. I heard Jeff say very clearly, Please tell Anne I am sorry. I'm sorry I did not call out to her to say goodbye. What I was experiencing was so beautiful, no words for it, and I was in such awe of the experience that I allowed myself to simply be with it. There was no struggle. At some point, I realized I was leaving, but I was already complete. It was too late to say goodbye. The communication stopped. I felt bathed in love in the golden light. I sensed that this light was Jeff and the light was in me and all things. I opened my eyes and the light show on the rock was over and it was complete. Salt Lake City friends Jan and Magdalene told me that as soon as they heard Jeff had died, they created an altar and went into meditation. Magdalene. Jan was deeply into grief. It hit her very hard. She was identifying with what you must be going through. But my experience was very different. So different that I didn't even mention it to her. I saw Jeff sitting on a cloud, smiling broadly, full of joy. Jeff's 79-year-old singing teacher and choir master at Jackson, in Jackson, Wyoming, felt extremely distraught upon hearing about Jeff. Then, a few days later, another friend told me that Bob had had a dream in which Jeff was sitting quietly in a room, meditating, at peace, and that this dream helped Bob a great deal. My young niece, Megan, found herself visited by Jeff a few days after he passed. Parentheses, she had also been visited my, by my late sister-in-law in the same manner, calling me up to say, did Kathy pass? Because I think I received a visit from her. As with Kathy, Megan did not see but felt Jeff's presence kinesthetically. At his entrance, she was shocked and flustered, saying, oh, are you okay? You know you have to go towards the light. And he answered, don't worry about me. I'm fine. Remember, I'm not a neophyte at this. She said he told her that there was a pipe and that she, he should have been cremated with it, that though it was just a tool and he didn't need it where he was now, his pipe and a few other ceremonial tools need to be properly disposed of, that Megan needed to tell Anne about this. I knew that Jeff had been apprenticed to a Cherokee shaman for six years and initiated as a pipe carrier but it had not occurred to me to cremate Jeff with his pipe. How little I knew him, and how interesting that he would go to young Megan, also on a medicine path, who would understand the necessity of disposing of it properly. She and I discussed the pipe at length, as well as the contents of his medicine bag. She contacted her teacher, who told her to do ceremony on the medicine bag and its contents, 
to disconnect it from Jeff and that since it was a man's pipe, it needed to go to a man. We decided that she would present it to whoever would be the appropriate person. Megan then told me to wrap the contents in red cloth and ship it to her. Jeff appeared to others as well, each time in different form or sensed in a way appropriate to the person. For example, on the day he died, I called one of his sisters, Andrea, and was unable to reach her twin, Stephanie. Andrea called me later that evening to tell me that Stephanie was upset because she thought she had unfinished business with her brother. Instantly, I told Andrea this was not true, that Jeff had no unfinished business with Stephanie, that he had always loved her unconditionally, that it was not in Jeff's nature to judge people. Well then, Andrea responded, Stephanie needs to hear that. Tell me where she is and I'll call her, I said. Stephanie was surprised to hear from me and spoke in her usual cool tone. Though she graciously thanked me for talking with her, I felt as if she were holding me at a distance during our phone call. The next day, Stephanie called and we spoke again. This time she was ecstatic. Last night, she told me, I was sitting on my bed with my cats on either side of me when Jeff appeared in a long robe. She said his presence not only freaked her out, but freaked her cats out, so she knew the experience was real. A week after Jeff died, my sister Kathy visited me from Seattle. I could sense that my attitude discombobulated her, since to me, Jeff's, quote, dearly departed soul didn't seem to be resting in peace. For from the very day he died, I had sensed Jeff as extremely active and free, joyous. Kathy would look at me strangely until the second night of her visit. The next morning, she told me that she had gotten up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. She went back to bed, but remembered that she had needed to close the door to keep the cats out. She got back up, but when I tried to close the door, I could not. There was a strong wind blowing through the door into my face. She actually needed two hands to get that door closed. This was a cold night in January with no windows open. Several days later, I was looking through some of Jeff's papers and came across an essay he wrote, the only essay that I found among his papers. He wrote reviews and, of and or translated thousands of articles and books for the International Journal Mathematical Reviews and for other mathematical and scientific publishers, but did very little public writing otherwise. The essay was about the Ho'opono ceremony, a part of the Huna religion in Hawaii. My eyes went right to a paragraph where Jeff mentions newly departing souls, sometimes appearing to those left behind as a wind. Though both Kathy and I had instantly recognized the wind as a manifestation of Jeff, and its startling strength had jostled her ideas about Jeff as resting in peace, the fact that this interpretation was synchronously confirmed delighted me. I'm reminded of another incident that occurred the day he died. Several months earlier, my friend Claudia had sent us two beautiful bowls, each painted with a different scene and in different colors to go with the wonderful dish set she was gradually collecting for us. She thought of one of them as Jeff's and the other as mine, though she had not mentioned this. A few hours after Jeff died, I was on the phone with Claudia when Felix jumped up on the refrigerator and then down to the counter in the process causing something to the floor and break. I walked in to see what had broken and said, Oh no, one of your beautiful bowls. Instantly, she responded. It was the green one, wasn't it? Yes, Jeff's bowl. Jeff was manifesting on different levels and in different ways to people who each seemed to need something specific from him to communicate his entrance to the larger reality. In some cases, it felt as if he and I were in cahoots with him working on invisible planes to help me figure out how to work with a particular person's grief or their narrowly conceived views on life and what lies beyond death. Thus he had appeared to Stephanie after I had called her, shattering her habitual reserve, and he had appeared to Kathy as a wind, breaking into her unquestioned Catholic assumptions. To me he came at the hour of the wolf, between 2 and 4 a.m., for the first month or so, I would awaken and for those two hours be invaded with mindless agitation. Both cats also registered a disturbance in my atmosphere. They would jump up and down off my bed and I would hear them quarreling in the living room. Only later did I realize what was going on during that nightly ordeal. 
The meaning came through clear contrast with what happened next. One night I awakened as usual, this time not into an agitated staticky void, but into what I can only describe as a warm pool of love. A love so encompassing and so thick that it seemed a kind of liquid. I felt like a baby cradled in the amniotic fluid of the womb, or better, as though I had actually attained the blissful commingling of two souls that we women everywhere silently long for in physical lovemaking. Indeed, this sense of being enveloped in love was so powerful and so intimate that, strangely enough, how could this be? I was alone with myself. I actually felt somewhat embarrassed. Our spiritual communion lingered the entire two hours. Ever since then, I feel it as the actual living space of my being when I'm able to quiet myself and listen. I now sense that the agitation of those weeks during those early morning hours was caused by the attempts of our two souls to cross the barrier, to reach from our respective dimension into the others, to carve that path between worlds. This is why I say that we now share space. In our longing for each other, we have entered the limitless void, which paradoxically feels utterly full. I have one final phenomena story to tell that demonstrates both Jeff's continuing existence and his mastery and delight in working with realms other than the one to which we are accustomed. This story concerns a friend of his, Dick, who had known Jeff since their student days as Princeton mathematicians. Both eventually left mathematics for less abstract, more human worlds, and for nearly 40 years, Jeff and Dick talked regularly by phone. During the first few days after he died, I was determined to personally contact those who had known him best so they would not have to hear through the grapevine. I knew Dick lived in Chicago because Jeff had addressed a package to him the night before he died, and it still sat in front of the door. But Dick's phone was not listed in the phone book, and I had not yet found Jeff's personal notebook with phone numbers in it. Every day I would pass by the front door and wince, looking at this package, now partially buried under other packages that had come to the house since he died. Why did Jeff order so much stuff just before he died? A new massage table, three pair of shoes, bodywork recertification, boxes of food supplements, books from England, etc., etc. I say it's because on some level he knew he was about to leave and another part of him wanted to anchor himself here. Friends Tasha and Stephen say it's because he wanted to leave more of himself behind. More stuff to deal with. In my initial raw state of shock and grief, I was not capable of sitting down to handwrite a letter to Dick. I could have typed one and printed it out, but the printer wasn't working at the time. Who was my tech support guy? Jeff. Finally, about 10 days after Jeff died, another package arrived. This one from Dick to Jeff. In a fit of frustration and pique, I abruptly wrote on the package in large letters, Deceased, call me as soon as you get this. Such an awful way for him to hear about Jeff's death, but I was distraught as Dick must have known when he walked in his door after being out of town to discover the box and called me at 3 a.m., utterly stricken. A few weeks later, Dick called again to say that he was, quote, getting used to the idea of Jeff being dead, though I don't like it. And then he told me a most remarkable story. About five days after Jeff died, but a number of days before we found out about it, I woke in the middle of the night and told my wife that I'd had a horrible nightmare, but that I couldn't remember it. Susan replied, I had a horrible nightmare too, and I do remember it, but I don't want to tell you. But she did. And here is her dream. Jeff Joel came to me and said, I know this sounds impossible, but I died in bed, asleep at home of a heart attack. Susan couldn't believe it. And even in the dream was wrestling with the idea, thinking she had a case of mistaken identity that maybe her 90 year old mentor had died. She had just spoken to Jeff three weeks earlier and thought he would still be in Massachusetts. So it couldn't be Jeff, she thought, because he wasn't at home. And then she told her husband, Jeff said one more thing. He said, first I came back, then I died. Parentheses, first he came back home to Indiana, then he died. Not only did Jeff use the dream medium to communicate his death to Dick through his wife's dream, and perhaps Dick's dream too, had he remembered it, 
but also from within Susan's dream itself, Jeff was responding to her unstated doubt and confusion. Upon hearing this and other stories, our friend Herb, who with his wife Perry had accompanied me through the entire shocky day of Jeff's early morning death, and who has long been a biblical scholar professing to be an atheist, remarked, you are making cracks in my edifice. Not me, I told him. Jeff, I am just the messenger. 